Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming my fourth guest from Toby Hooper's 1974 classic, landmark classic, I should say, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Ed Gwynn. Ed Gwynn, of course, you know, he um, is the cattle drive driver at the end of the movie who comes and saves the fucking day. Yes, I'm having him on the show today to talk about filming that scene. Also, too, I found out he was a musician um, long before that. He has a, a tie to Janis Joplin. And, of course, he composed the music for Bob Burns' Mongrel. And he had a cameo as a chili cook-off judge in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. And he's out there working now and um, doing conventions and so forth when quarantine is not happening. So I'm having him on to talk about all that stuff today. And it's going to be great. It's going to be fucking exciting. I'm the luckiest fanboy in the whole wide world, everyone. I can't tell you how lucky enough I am, even with all this craziness going on. It's April 1st, and let's get it started. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Ed Gwynn. Hello. Hello, Ed. Welcome to the show. How are you today, sir? Very well, thank you. And you? Oh, getting through in this crazy time we're in. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're in Redding or? Uh... Yeah, R- Redding, California. Mhm, mhm. And yeah, it's oh. pretty insane. At least we got the sun out today. It's because it, it was rainy for a couple of days. And makes it hard to even get out and stretch your legs. Yeah, <laughs> that's for damn sure. So, um, this is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. My pleasure. What do you want to talk about? Well, I'd like to, I'd like to start with, um, I have found out that, uh, you had been a musician, um, and involved in music, uh, before Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, so going back in time, at what age did you start gravitating toward music? Oh, I, uh, you know, high school band kind of. That uh, basically was the beginning. Uh, I think, as I remember, it was uh, Ray Charles's uh, "Hit the Road, Jack" that got my attention. And so, uh, yeah, high school band, and then obviously coming to uh, Texas and uh, entering the music department, composition department there, mm-hmm. and then uh, being, uh, you know. Uh, College dropout, uh, rock and roll wannabe. <laughs> One from there. Was uh, Hit the Road Jack your first record that you ever bought? Mm, that I bought. No, I think the first record I ever bought, I think I just heard that on the radio, you know. Mm-hmm. I think the first record I ever bought may have been El Paso. Marty Robbins, El Paso, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, or may, and then maybe also, these, back in those days, you know, you buy 45s, right? They were single tune yeah. plays, basically. Fewer albums. I mean, my parents bought me a few albums, but uh, I remember El Paso, and I also remember buying, uh, what was that? Uh, uh, oh, uh, Sam Cooke tune. Um, Wonderful World? I don't know. Yeah, it might have been. I think it was a little bluer than that, though. So, uh, Chain Gang, I think. Maybe. Oh, Chain Gang, yeah. The sound of a man working on the chain. Yeah, that tune. That's a good song, yeah. Uh, do you yeah. play... Do you play uh, many instruments? I'm uh, primarily a keyboard player. Uh, I mean, my most of my musical career uh, was as a was a composer, you know. But uh, in rock and roll or in bands and stand up stuff, I played uh, uh, bass and then a lot of woodwinds, depending on on the opportunity, flutes and saxophones. But yeah. A lot of stuff, um, but keyboards is my forte because 
it's the best instrument for composition, not necessarily just for songwriting. You can write a tune on a on a flat top on an on an acoustic guitar, but if you want to do real sort of orchestral work, you got to have a, a keyboard under your hands at some point, anyway. Yeah. So, did you uh, grow up listening to primarily R and B and country? No, no, not really. I mean, uh, a lot of different stuff. You know, I remember as a little kid when Hank Williams died. You know, because in San Antonio they played it all day on the radio. You know, that was all country stuff, and it was pretty common. Uh, but I'd say, really, you know, everything you can imagine from. Uh, Oh, there was some tune, there was a TV show called, I don't think it was called Hit Parade, but it was mm -hmm. some weird, uh, you know, popular music kind of TV show. Yeah. And then when I got a little older, I used to watch a lot of Lawrence Welk because I liked the uh, orchestration and stuff and the kind of dopey, uh, you know, music that they did. You know, just any kind, man. I like it's uh, music if it's good. You know, from Wagner to, uh, you know, uh, Spike Jones. I didn't care as long as it was uh, musical. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool, yeah. The 60s was a magical time for rock music, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. It, it, like, whatever happened to it, you know? It's it's, it's gone now. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's about the tunes, you know? They're, they're not written the same way. And, uh, yeah, it's very different. That was... Uh, I guess it was that, that transition. You know, a lot of people think of rock and roll as being guitar music, but really the original rock and roll and what built so much of what became known as rock and roll was primarily piano music, piano players with saxophones as the melody instrument or solo instrument, and mm -hmm. guitar was the rhythm. <laughs> if you go, go, go buy a Ray Charles, I mean, a, uh, yeah, Ray Charles was really kind of a transition time, but go buy uh, or listen to uh, uh, Chuck Berry, right? right? Everybody thinks of Chuck Berry because he was a guitar player. But you listen to his tunes, and the guitar is just rhythm. Piano player is way up front, and the saxophone player is way up front. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's it, it's a whole different deal. And the Beatles really are responsible. Well, the Beatles and you're gonna get me jabbering here forever. But the uh, the the genre that really encapsulated what we take to be rock and roll, at least that rock and roll of the '60s, '70s, uh, was uh, largely uh, Beatles inspired with a bunch of the uh, rockabilly crossover stuff mm -hmm. from the 50s, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to be around all the stuff that was big in the 60s and 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 hang out with the people that uh, were doing it and were around it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I, I was listening to um, a previous interview you did, and uh, you said that uh, uh, you knew Janis Joplin. Yeah, uh, Austin was a little town, so everybody knew everybody, if, if you were cool, anyway. Mm -hmm. Only about 30 or 40, you know, kids who considered themselves uh, 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 advanced thinkers <laughs> yeah. and not, not, not sheep, not followers. And so uh, Janice was among them. You know, there were the old uh, folk things at the Chuck Wagon at the Student Union. Mm -hmm. And we'd, we'd meet up there on Thursday nights and then use that as a jumping off point to go go to a party somewhere and drink beer, do more music. And then that just sort of, you know, she grew and my best friend was uh, her manager and took her out to the West Coast and in many ways, was responsible for us getting involved in a lot of uh, the San Francisco scene at the time uh, because, uh, you know, it was a weird... Austin had a big uh, a big footprint in San Francisco mm -hmm. about 67 on up to uh, uh, the early 70s because 
because uh, there's sort of a cross-pollination between the scene in Austin and the scene in San Francisco, such as it was. <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, born and raised in San Francisco, and I'm just so immersed okay. in, in that culture of uh, psychedelic rock and stuff. I actually went to a Comic-Con back in October, and I met uh, two of the surviving members of Big Brother and the Holding Company, uh, Dave Getz and Peter Alpin, and uh, they were very nice oh. guys. Yeah. I'll be damned. Where was the Comic-Con at? Um, Santa Rosa. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, at first yeah. I was... At first, I was like, why are these guys here? And then I realized R. Crumb drew their album covers. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. And, of course, Gilbert was a good friend of mine. You know, he and I lived together here in Austin. Shelton, who did, you know, uh, Under Warthog and all those uh, crazy, uh, including Crumb, you know, published a lot of Crumb stuff. And Rip Off Press, down at the bottom of uh, Turo Hill, uh was uh, where a lot of that stuff was produced, you know. Yeah. Did you uh, uh, open shows for them? For Big Brother? Yeah, as a matter of fact. Uh, the first show we did in San Francisco was what I thought was 100,000 people. It probably was more like 10,000, but I'd never seen that many, so it didn't really matter. It was a big show in Golden Gate Park, and uh, we had just arrived like a few days before and it, it floored us we were the we were the opening act for Santana and Santana then to Big Brother and what? that was the show <laughs> wow that must have been amazing I mean the, the, this, was this uh, pre-fame Santana or was he already big no I think I think it, it was um, shit, I don't know, man. Uh, I think it was before he had already recorded the tunes that became popular and big, but I don't think they were released or it hadn't gotten momentum or I don't know what, but yeah, uh, yeah, I remember doing those songs, uh, or you come in, in line. Uh, a couple of others, uh, the Tito, not Tito Puente, what is that guy's name? His conga player. Oh, Escovito? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, they were, uh, they were rolling, and obviously Big Brother was rolling, and, and we were just uh, a little uh, country hits there, uh, being blown, bowled over by the action. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's amazing. Did you, did you guys uh, play with any other bands? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, we, we rehearsed with the Dead. Uh, it's a beautiful day, and us and the Dead had a uh, rehearsal space in uh, on, uh, on Patrol Street in an old movie theater that was uh, sort of decommissioned. And, uh, again, being the, the small... Uh, fries, the small fish in the pond. Mm -hmm. We would we would work in the morning. The dead would just be getting through when we got there, basically. Yeah. We'd rehearse for three or four hours, and then it's a beautiful day. It'd come in in the afternoon, and then the dead would come in in the evening. And then we played at the Avalon a few times. Uh, you know, trying to think. Uh, we played with Howlin' Wolf and... Uh, Steve Miller. Yeah, Steve Miller. That was that was uh, a show. I spent a lot of time at the Avalon because Chet was our manager mm -hmm. uh, when we came out there, and that you know he was the hit, sort of the literally head of the family dog. And so Marilyn and I, my wife and I, we just kind of you know hung around and groupied around for all the shows. So we saw and knew everybody, but, uh, I know Boz was, well, that was all the Mother Earth connection, but, uh, I don't know, a lot of stuff, a lot of people, a lot of bands, we, we didn't really catch on, our drummer left as soon as we got there, mm -hmm. so we had to start over after the, that Golden Gate show mm -hmm. and build a new band, but 
that's that's life, you know. He was the adult in the group. He was ten years older than the rest of us, and actually expected to make money, you know. Yeah. <laughs> had a family, all that silly stuff. So he he bailed and and got out of there. And so uh, when we might have built enough momentum to roll forward, uh, we were basically dis disassembled for uh, six or eight months. And in those days, six or eight months was a lifetime, you know, the way things wax and wane. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's that's phenomenal. What was your band called again? Conqueroos, C-O-N-Q-U-E-R-O-O. Conqueroos, wow. That's phenomenal. You got to play with all those great people at that magical time in San Francisco. Wow. Yep. No, no S at the end, not that it matters. Yeah. C-O-N-Q-U-E-R-O-O. Yeah. So how did you get cast in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Um, through connections with people here in Austin mm-hmm. uh, who knew that uh, at that time, by that point, you know, uh, I had gone kind of through my, I'd gone from my uh, uh, career as a uh, wannabe rock and roll star to... Uh, uh, a man of the people, and uh, mm-hmm. decided I wanted to be uh, in the Longshoremen's Union because uh, I liked the politics. Mm-hmm. And I, I managed to uh, hang around, drag around, and uh, do enough uh, qualifying to where I got uh, got into the uh, local. And um, that Work, work ships and stuff, loading and unloading and whatnot, and then evolved from that into uh, my brother-in-law knew a kid who had driven a truck once mm-hmm. and decided, you know, maybe he and I could uh, get a truck and go in the trucking business, and so that's what we did. We went out and bought an old Peterbilt and started hauling stuff around the Central Valley and uh, eventually moved back to Austin, brought all the all the stuff from Berkeley, our house basically, in the back of the 40-footer and my couple of cars and uh, came to uh, back to Austin and so uh, was here in town with a truck when somebody needed one, basically. You couldn't just walk up and get a truck, you know. You, yeah. It's a thing that required uh, expense and effort, and basically they, they needed one, so they hired hired a prop with a dummy to drive it, and that was me. <laughs> and uh, who was on the set that day when you got there? Um, well, Bob and... Uh, Daniel Pearl and uh, Ed and Marilyn and Gunner and uh, uh, a guy named Perry Lorenzo who drove the pickup truck, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. and uh, obviously Hooper. And uh, uh, did I say uh, Kim Hinkle? Yeah, Kim was there. And uh, that's it. Nobody else. Yeah. No actors. Beyond us. How was uh, Toby Hooper to work with? Oh, I don't know. You know, I mean, uh, he was uh, a kind of uh, terse, you Mm. know, Uh, not really heavily focused on directing in terms of telling you what to do, but was real good at telling you to do it again. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, he was what he was, you know. uh, He was the director, and uh, he directed us to uh, behave, as it were, in a particular manner. (laughs) (laughs) Did you you get that from him again when you uh, had that small part in in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2? No. No, I don't even remember that part. You know the story on that? No. <laughs> uh, shit. My manager, my manager one day 
couple of years ago, called me up and he said, hey, were you in uh, uh, Chainsaw 2? And I said, no. Uh, why you yes. Well, uh, you sure? I said, no, I wasn't in it. What are you talking about? He said, okay, well, uh, I thought you were in it. And I said, okay, well, I'll talk to you later. And about two minutes later, this, this screenshot arrives with my big silly ass standing there yeah. in the shot. And sure enough, I was in it. And Jane saw two for, I don't know, two seconds or something. Yeah. And I had no recollection, man. I mean, no recollection. All I can figure is that uh, I was there so short a time. It was some couple of hours on a on an afternoon in some storefront in downtown Austin, and I, I just have no no memory of it. You know, it was it meant nothing to me. Mm -hmm. I guess more at the point. I'd moved on to uh, uh, bigger and better things, or so I thought. Of course. So I, <laughs> they called me up. I guess asked me if I would do it. I said, yeah, I don't even remember if I got paid or not. And he, he, I had absolutely no memory of the process. So to say, I didn't, I wasn't uh, sure. Are you sure that uh, Toby directed it or did Kim direct it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, um, did, did, it's, did Toby direct it? Toby did direct it, yeah. Okay, well, I, I did correct it. Yeah, I I, uh, I I don't know. I can't tell you anything about that because I really have no memory. Okay. It's starting to be a long time ago, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so so when you did do um, the first one, uh, was it a lot of take? Uh -huh. Was it a lot of takes? Were you there all day? Yes, Lord. <laughs> it, it was the most running I've done uh, forever, and and since then, you know, it was over and over again. The, the dummy, you know, and the business with Marilyn wasn't too difficult. There wasn't too many takes. But boy, that stupid uh, getting the timing right on the uh, on the scene with us running away, me running towards the camera and Marilyn running. Mm -hmm. Actually, Daniel gets the blame for that because he's the one, as he told me later at a show we did together, and he was the one that kept having us go again because of course he was shooting and he could see what it looked like and of course I was cheating madly trying to uh, get off of the asphalt and onto the grass where it was a little bit more comfortable to run on and each take that slip left a foot or so which probably caused it to go longer and more but anyway yeah wow so did you go to the rap party or a screening of the movie a uh, screening yeah 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 that was really the uh, only time I saw it for about 30 years. Um, yeah, it was at a movie theater downtown and uh, in Austin. And uh, uh, somebody, a friend of mine, actually a lady who lives out there, uh, still in Berkeley, was at the screening and said some fool after the movie was over <laughs> right up a chainsaw in the parking lot and scared everybody to death. I don't remember that, but I can believe it. <laughs> yeah, anything can happen with that. Uh, but it, I can imagine the audience reaction was pretty intense. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I uh, I still, I think, can uh, rightly say that uh, justifies it. I was the only one in the movie ever to get a cheer, you know. When I hit Gunner with the wrench, you know, the the uh, theater let out a big whoop because uh, there was a lot of tension in the room up until that point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I claim to be the hero of the movie. Yeah, I mean, you pretty much are. I mean, that scene, you know, just holds up all these years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know? It's I, in 1987, there was a teen movie called Summer School, and it had two guys who were obsessed with the movie, and they showed the movie in class. And they're watching, you know, your scene at the end, 
and uh, the mm-hmm. princi- the principal walks in and he says, "Good God, what is this you're watching?" And Mark Harmon says, "It's a documentary about the safety use of power tools." <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen that clip. I, in fact, uh, uh, I, I didn't remember it as being in a in a classroom. Somehow, I thought it was on in uh, somebody's house on the, on a TV or something. But yeah, I, I remember that line now. It just reminded me though. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Was that thing made eighty seven, something like that? Yeah, eighty seven. Uh huh. Yeah, somebody just uh, uh, contacted me about a reuse in some new film that's coming out. Nobody contacted me about that one, but but uh, yeah, there's some uh, movie in the uh, works with uh, I guess some footage from it that they want to reuse. Nice, nice. Mm-hmm. Now I've I've talked to Dan Ziger and Terry and John Dugan, and uh, they, mm-hmm. they all seem pretty upset. You know that they never made a profit <laughs> off of this movie. Are you? <laughs> Hell no, shit. You kidding? Uh, I wasn't trying to get rich. I was trying to get a day's pay for my truck and my time. So it worked out great. <laughs> I had no uh, no desire to. Uh, to be a, a, a movie star or any uh, illusions that I would be as a result of uh, that effort. I already had, by that point, when was it, 74? Yeah. I already had 10 years of professional musicianship behind me, so I knew what you made and what you got paid in the real world, so I wasn't, uh, I wasn't expecting uh, much of an income, and I, I got a good chunk of money for my day, basically. They paid me for the truck as it were, and what I negotiated. And I got it that day and left and was a happy chappy. I don't know that they got paid for years, some of them. So that's disappointing, but why cry over spilled milk? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So after the movie came out, uh, was your life changed at all? No, no. I had nothing to do with it. Didn't know anything about it. Didn't know anybody that saw it or knew anything about it. It wasn't until... uh, did that bit in uh, Butcher Boys for Kim and uh, and uh, the fellows from San Antonio. Uh, uh, oops, it's embarrassing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dwayne uh, and uh, his partner. I can see their names in my head, but I can't remember. Anyway, and they they said, uh, oh, "Would you mind signing our poster?" And I said. Uh, yeah, sure, whatever. And uh, they bought the poster over, and I signed it. And he said, "And you know, you really ought to, you ought to go to uh, some of these fan shows that uh, happen. Uh, people are, really would love to get your autograph and like to meet you, and yada, yada, yada. I'm going, huh, why, what? And uh, about that time, I guess it was... Uh, uh, yeah, it was one of those guys turned me on to a fellow that does a big show in Dallas. Mm-hmm. Real nice guy. And he invited me to do the show, pulled some stills out of the movie for me to um, use uh, at his convention. And so I went to Texas Frightmare Weekend mm-hmm. and was just floored. People from Japan and Germany and, you know, England and all over the place came just to meet me and get my autograph. I thought, this this could work out. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I had nothing to do with that scene, you know. I mean, those guys were actors. I was a musician who happened to own a truck. (laughs) Yeah. So they they had expectations that I did not have. And, and, And they were naive. I mean, I'm older than them. Yeah. So... That was another factor. I'd already, you know, like I said, uh, been in the entertainment industry. And I use that with air quotes for uh, lack of uh, uh, face-to-face. Yeah. Because it is a business. And, you know, if you don't do business, you, you don't survive very well. If you have, if you have uh, expectations, they usually don't pan out. So. Yeah, that's what I've learned. I was happy with it. I was glad, yeah, man. I was glad to have it to, to get the check and to walk away and, and never thought about it again. And I think Gunner was pretty unhappy as well. And of course, it and all of them are still 
moaning and bitching, you know, about yeah. you taking advantage of, but come on, you know. <laughs> yeah. So years later, you composed the music for Mongrel, which is very om- yeah. ominous music. I, I like that music. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have to listen to it again. I haven't. Burns kept a pretty hard thumb on me, so I, I kept trying to uh, to richen it up a little bit with some melody or silliness, which is my want, but it didn't work out. Bob was a big fan of Kraftwerk, and so he kept, you know, pushing me in the uh, screechy, scratchy, uh, you know, techno German direction, which is kind of how it turned out. Uh, but yeah, I need to listen. You know, I hadn't even listened to that or know anything about it. I imagine it's stored in my thousands of tapes somewhere. I'll have to see if I can uh, check it out. Can you still see the movie anywhere? Um, it's on YouTube, and I'm sure you could buy a copy on um, on uh, eBay on VHS or something. But it is definitely on YouTube. Cool. I have to check it out. Yeah, I, I like that music a lot. Great. Um, so yeah, you've been doing the conventions and stuff, and uh, you've done yeah. you've done small parts in movies here and there. Did uh, doing the conventions uh, get you into the movies again? Yeah, uh, you know, first the the, the Butcher Boy uh, cameo, and those guys turned me on to the scene because I didn't know it was there, and then uh, uh, my manager Sal. <laughs> Mm-hmm. As a production company and does movies, and he he cast me in one, and then a a, a guy in Dallas put Marilyn and I together in one, you know, as husband and wife, which I thought was hilarious. Um, the two remaining survivors, and uh, it's called Sacrament. Did you ever see that one? Uh, no, but I've heard of it. A nice little movie, but uh, yeah, you know, I'd say my awareness of the scene was probably a result of the uh, convention uh, appearances and whatnot. Nice. So, uh, so after this quarantine is over, do you have any plans uh, for the future uh, as far as movies and conventions or music? Yeah, I've got, uh, only the ones that have been canceled as a result of this. Horror, which I look forward to. We were supposed to do uh, Fright Fair in May, May 3rd, 3rd or 4th. That's not going to happen, obviously. It's yeah. September. And there's some people in England that were trying to get me to do something. Well, I said trying to get me. I'm sure they, they will decide how much they're trying to get me, but <laughs> uh, it's been discussed. And uh, about it, you know, I still uh, do, uh, I have a you know, small company with a partner, and we do, you know, software development. I mean, at granny level now, and that I don't have that many clients, but uh, we do a little development as needed. The uh, it's a profitable, uh, modern version of composition, you know, you actually get paid for it, so that's what I do. Nice. Well, if you get uh, booked at a convention in California, I'll be there. Absolutely. Yeah, man. So what is it? Uh, what is your thing? It's a, it's a podcast. Yep, it's called Splat from the Past. I've done 761 interviews so far. I'm just wow. out here in the countryside. There's nothing to do. I just plug them away. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. How do you spend your time for income, as it were? Uh, I collect disability because I had a car accident about five years ago, and um, I'm paying off a of debt with it and stuff, and it's almost over. So I'm gonna be. Yeah. Pers- I'm going to be, you know, pursuing showbiz, you know, more seriously once it's over. And, um, yeah, just that it's a life changing experience when you get into a car wreck. I uh, can't imagine, buddy. I had my, I had a, I had a spinal cord injury that sort of put, put a little hitch in my get along about four years ago. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, it's not cool. I, you, I didn't, wasn't smart enough to sue anybody over it, but there's still time, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you have trouble? Uh, um, do you have trouble bending or uh, sitting or anything? Oh, oh yeah, I can't. I mean, I can't walk. Basically, I have uh, arm canes, and I just bought a, a, a walker the other day that I'm going to use to improve my posture because these arm canes, you kind of walk stooped over like an old man. 
Yeah, I had two canes when I got out of the hospital after I, I broke my leg in seven places, and I had yeah. I had my own wheelchair for a little bit. It was it was pretty nuts, but um, I can mm. I can walk just fine, other than all the arthritis I got. Yeah, buddy. Well, I, all my arthritis didn't talk to me, <laughs> and I couldn't walk. <laughs> you know, and once I started loading up my joints and started screaming, yeah, I, I was in a wheelchair for about two years. You know. I have it sitting right here in front of me. It's my most comfortable and most expensive chair in my house. So I use it frequently. Yeah. Well, you know, all you have to do is keep going, you know, and just say, fuck it, you know. (laughs) That's it. 100%. Straight ahead. But the uh, full speed ahead, damn the torpedoes or whatever the uh, statement was. (laughs) Uh, Well, Ed, thank you. you something. Yeah, Ed. Have you talked to John Dugan? Doug, oh, yeah, I've talked to John. Okay, good, yeah, because uh, he's, a, he's a good guy, quite a chatter, and uh, makes a good interview, so I want to make sure you didn't miss him. I didn't miss him. I didn't miss Terry or Dan Ziger, but I would like to get Ed Neal next. Mm, well, uh, it can be kind of hard to get him, but, you know. Uh, it's more getting in touch with him. He'd probably be happy to do it, but yeah, he, he, ne- he never answers the phone or reads his mail or whatever. I don't quite know what Ed's story is, but sure, why not? You should come uh, when you get to mobile and uh, get some uh, coin in your pockets. Come on down to uh, Austin area, and you know you can go out to the yeah. service station, and you know. There's still a little bit of the scene here. Yeah, I got a friend in Dallas I'd like to see. Um, I definitely would like to take a trip to Texas uh, in the future, you know, once everything settles. Um, Absolutely. But um, thank you so much, Ed. I mean, this was a lot of fun. Well, cool. I'm glad, man. Thanks for uh, thinking about me and uh, keep on keeping on. My pleasure, sir. Have a great day. You too. Adios. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Ed Gwynn. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, man. man, All that music, San Francisco scene, that's awesome. I'm glad I talked to him because I love San Francisco rock because that's where I'm from. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.